let's do some introductions um, in terms of what this is about. Actually, uh, you know, this replaces the uh, on water clinic we had planned for today. So we, I decided to try to turn this into a virtual clinic slash webinar. Um, let's go on um, the agenda. I prepared some material on uh, sailing fast upwind because I really believe that most of the newer sailors have trouble sailing fast. And uh, that's obviously a, be, besides sailing fast, sailing the shortest distance are the only two things that can help you win a race, right? <laughs> Either you sail faster and sort of uh, are right near there uh, in, in terms of the distance you sail or you sail a lot less distance and maybe not as fast, you can win. But you got to at least do fairly well in both of those categories to win a race. And my, my view is that sailing fast is the easiest thing, the first, easiest first thing to deal with. And what I did was I went back to some sailors who have been influential to me and uh, things they said to me, I, I kind of remembered the way they said it. And I call them time-tested phrases. So we'll, we'll look at those real quickly and then we have a real treat because Mr. Schultz has consented to uh, have us critique a video we took yesterday of him sailing upwind. And so we can all kind of watch David and, um, and uh, you know, we'll all kind of say what we see and, and we'll try to apply those time-tested phrases to that video. And hopefully we'll have plenty of time left. Brian's requested that we talk a little bit about starting and let's take a few minutes now and see what other things you want to hear about. And I'll write them down. Sailing fast. Sailing fast. Okay. Okay. So there's the agenda. Uh, let's, let's do the sailing fast upwind then. All right. Here are the time tested phrases. And I, I took some time to remember who told me this and uh, I wanted to give them credit because all of them have been really helpful in, in, getting to me to dragging me through the 20 years now that I've been sailing to the limited skill level that I have, have achieved. But uh, uh, so let's look through these and I have a slide for each of these, but I don't want to spend all the time going over each slide, one slide for each of these until we really need it. But let's just look at each of these, put pressure on the boat. Andy, both Andy and Kent, just stop, just say, it's, if you don't think you know what that means, say, and I'll note that, and then we'll spend more time on it later. Don't know what it means. Pressure on the boat. Either. I don't know what it means. Okay. Okay, put pressure on the boat. Roughly, quickly means the harder the harder you can get the more force you can put it put in the sails from the wind and the harder you hike the faster you'll go you know one way to think about it is that taking your two fingers and pushing on a watermelon melon seed and and squeezing it so hard that it slips out you know the faster the more pressure you put on it the faster forward it's going to slip that's a very rough analogy but we'll go into that briefly it's you have to put power in the sails and you have to hike to be fast. Trim to the leech and steer to the luff. This Peter Tumanov was a, a professor of economics at Marquette, Russian guy, very colorful, big beard, was a sailmaker. And at some of the early regattas I went to, he was there. And he's just the nicest guy. And he's a very thoughtful sailor. And he told me, he told me this phrase. And it's really helped me. And basically what it means is you, you trim your sail watching the leech. And then once you get that right, and then you steer watching your luff or, you know, paying attention to the front of the sail. And that's a nice procedure for getting the, both the sail trim and the angle of attack right. So we'll talk about that in more detail if anybody wants to. So the, the leech is the, aft end of the sail correct correct 
fairly end of the sale. And then the left is the, the, yeah, I know. Yeah. the front of the sale, right. The next one, Feather and Ease. This is in a puff now. You've got some questions, Al. Okay. Dick and Dennis. Go ahead, Dick. Okay, I, I, I understand what it means, steer to the love, but what are you looking for when you trim to the leech? Okay, well, we'll get into that with the slide. But okay. I think what we'll do is we'll just do a real quick, quick brush by these, and then we'll watch David, and then we'll go into any of the details of it, any of these that we need to, okay? Okay. In a puff, feather and ease, hike and trim. You want, to, you want that boat to stay rock solid at the same angle of heel. And to do that, you have to ease your sail. You have to feather into the wind just slightly. You have to hike hard. And then as soon as the puff's gone, you have to trim back in. And that is huge. If you learn how to do that right, that is huge. Next one. John Porter's really big on, John Porter said, touch every control on every puff. That's almost overkill, but he's saying, work your controls, work them hard. So we'll talk about that. Buddy Melgus, every time he, Buddy speaks about scow sailing, he says it's all about angle of heel, keeping it constant and the exact right angle of heel. My friend, uh, Will Hendershot, who's a Canadian sailor, used to sail uh, he was actually on the Canadian Olympic team, although he didn't sail in the Olympics, but he was one of the, you know, the, the training partners. Uh, flat, flat sails are fast. Uh, Stephanie Robel, in the session she's been doing, didn't say this in so many words, but let, we should talk about why dirty air makes you crazy. And then when I was first starting, my Uncle Milt told me to get comfortable in the boat, and I'm still learning how to do that. There are still so many ways to make things easier and get comfortable so you can focus on what, what's important. So those are, I think, eight, eight great things to, to kind of adopt as a journey, because you're never going to do all of these things right perfectly. But if you if you take one or two of these and start working on them and then start building in a few more of them and just keep working on them, you're definitely going to get faster. And uh, I would encourage you to take a couple of these and adopt them and really learn what they mean and, you know, make them, make them your own. All right. So now here's the fun part. Yesterday we were out and I, we mounted a 360 camera on David's boat. Uh, and uh, this is one leg in one of the races or part of one leg in one of the races. It's, it's kind of an interesting race because it's, it's light at first and then it gets a little windier and then it goes back light, just kind of like Dua, I guess. This is after the start. David, David has not had a good start, as you can see. Uh, there's several boats in front of him. That doesn't turn out to, he's not in too bad of air because he's pretty far behind, but we won't... Uh, we don't worry about that. So take notes. And I should be able to uh, move this around. Oh, I know why I can't, hold on. So I can move this around. Look at the um, 
look at his sail and look at the leech and the luff for one thing. Look at when he's hiking, which is not, I mean, he's not right now because it's, it's somewhat light. Now look, he starts to hike, look at the sail. Now he's back in the boat. Now he sheets in a little bit. Look at the distance here between the, the blocks. See if you can notice any differences in the way the leech lot lies or, or you know, is, is angled or curved. I mean, it's not, they're not fast changes, but there are changes. You have the camera mounted to the tiller? Yeah. Yes. I think there's one, I think there's one more tack coming. See what happened after he just uh, sheeted in like that? Look at his leech. Okay, that's the end. So we'll pause this and maybe go back um, in a bit. But. Uh, so the distance between the blocks might mean that he's not, Dave's not putting maximum pressure on the boat, Al. And that might be true, but it might, it might not be true as well. What do you guys think about the distance between those blocks? What's your range in the distance between those blocks in inches, roughly? Vicki. Do you want to know what mine always is, or do you want to know what I just saw? No, what yours is. Oh, well, my range um, can be, well, standard upwind sailing, this kind of brace, probably a foot 
maybe even more. Okay. I would say that my experience is your range should be such that it's at the closest, maybe four to five inches. When you're really sheeted in and sailing fast in a big breeze, you should be able to sheet in so you're four to five inches apart right here. And then as the breeze lightens, that gets a little bigger. And like Rob said, in really light air, that might be a foot and a half. Oh, yeah. I was thinking the differential between the two spots. I mean, oh, yeah. really tight air? We're talking I, I was thinking three about inches. the range, but the change, not yeah, the Yeah, me light. too. Okay. I was thinking about the change. Yeah, so we all, <laughs> maybe we all said the same thing. But there's got to be a big range there. That's the whole point. And we'll talk about the leech because really the guide is, the guide's sort of twofold. One, if it's light enough that you have to worry about keeping the leech open, and we'll talk about that, then the guide is the leech. When it's heavy, then for me the guide is sheet that thing as hard as you can because you're trying to flatten the sail. So that it becomes less we're looking at the leech and more just trying to pull that thing in as hard as you, as you can and use your controls to stay upright. All right. And then so, a little bit more according to your article on that. Right. All right, what else? Uh, what other comments do you guys have? One thing I noticed. What, what's the biggest, let's, let's say, what's the biggest thing you think Dave could improve on? Boat heel. Yeah, his heel, he's a little flat here, isn't he? Well, the, the angle of heel, as we saw, is pretty important. So I think just from what I've read a couple of times, it's 15 degree, if you can maintain a 15 degree heel, your, uh, your board is perpendicular, which gives, which is what, what you want it to be consistently. Right. And, um, Dave seemed to be, his heel, during his mass, you could see, was um, moving back and forth quite a bit, which would indicate his heel was changing quite a bit. So it wasn't really a real constant heel, which is what would be the most desirable. Okay, so Steve votes for heel, and I think that's a very good one. Who else has a vote on what's his biggest area for improvement? Come on, don't be shy. Dennis wants to talk. It's okay to do this. Hey, the, it, it just looked like the luff was, he was pinching a lot, but I don't know if that's just the camera and the shadowing, but no, it was being, I, think I saw a lot of backwind. I think you've nailed it. He let that sail luff an awful lot during that, uh, during that time. And uh, some people, and we'll talk more about this, but some people do that because they think otherwise they're going to be overpowered. And there was times when he was hiking and he was luffing, and I'm sure it's just because he don't, didn't think he could handle any more uh, sail uh, force in the sail. But that's why we have controls like Vang and, and Traveler. And so we're going to talk about how we could manage that force and put it to good use to go for faster forward rather than letting the sail luff. So David, I, you know, that's my vote, but let's see what else other people have to say. Well, heel is everything, so that's number one. He should keep his boat on its lines. Two, he, he should be managing that sail. You know, if he gets hit with a puff he thinks is too heavy, ease the sheet. You don't hold on to the sheet and luff up into the air. You, you ease your sheet, hike, and then trim. Yeah. So if you don't have your boat on its lines on a steady basis, then the rest is kind of harder to uh, gain benefit from. Keep your lines, keep on your angle as Steve Rettier said, manage your sail and move your body weight as necessary to keep that pressure on the boat. Okay. So Rob thinks heel is more important than luffing and I, I might agree, but I might not. Well, and Andy Burdick, in, a, in the video we did of him talking about sailing, he said heel was everything. And you just showed that, uh, that Buddy Melga says heel is everything. I think it's foundational. And then sure, if you let your sail luff, 
I guess my point is, it's the way you keep the angle of heel constant that matters. You could keep your angle of heel constant if you're really good at luffing just the right amount without hiking. You know what I mean? You, you could, could, but it wouldn't be very fast. It wouldn't be fast. So you really, I mean, the, the trick of it is you need to be cognizant of at least these three things and may be making small adjustments all the time. So I think what's ha what I see happening is that, you know, it's a little bit of a set it and forget it kind of mentality. You pulled in the sail, that, that looks good. I'm not laughing right now, that looks good. But now I'm laughing and um, not necessarily making the adjustments. So you have to constantly be checking off all of these things. Um, you know, in a sequence or as they adjust and change and making modifications. So nothing should be set it and forget it. You shouldn't just be holding your tiller in one position. You shouldn't just be having your main sheet in one spot. You need to always be making adjustments, small adjustments, but still adjustments. So if you have a checklist in your head. I think you got to be putting bang on to, uh control some of that um, power. Right, right. Both, I both that was going to be my question is, with all the controls available to us, which would be the first one to use? Yep, and the answer is usually Vang, and we'll talk about that. But yes, Vang is the first thing. And he, I, I don't think, David, correct me if I'm wrong, I, don't, I did not see you adjust the Vang in this, in this clip anyway. Right, I don't think I did. Later, later, I don't know which race this was, but later in the races, I was more cognizant of it. Um, it was the first time out for me this year, so I was kind of getting my sea legs a little bit too. Sure, sure. All right, any other comments? Uh, David is a pretty big guy, so uh, the athleticism required for him to get in the middle, which looking at that picture, he should be kneeling in the inside the boat, or you know, right. um, trying to get as much weight to the you know to the leeward side as possible. At least right. in this picture, you know. Right. He that's hard. Seat. That's you know, he's a big guy. You know? yeah. um, that is correct. Yeah. Uh, is there a different angle of heel for each wind velocity? I mean, if a strong wind, you want to be flatter, and and a light wind, you want more heel, or nope. Always, or, always 20, 20 degrees or, or what? 15 yeah. degrees always. 15 yeah. degrees or whatever it is where the board is vertical. You want that lured board vertical. Right. Which basically means chain plate out of the water. Exactly. Water just under the rail at the chain plate. Right. The only other thing I want to comment on, and then we'll, we'll go look at some of these things in more detail, is, Vi and Vicky queued it up. Not only not set it and forget it, and makes adjustments all the time, but did you notice that he was making adjustments It would be every 10 or 15 seconds, and sometimes it would be a really big one. He would take that sheet and crank it in, and if you're watching the sale when he did that, it's like the sale is you know, kind of bouncing around because of it. So we, we, he has to learn how to make smoother adjustments and he may make them more frequently. Mm. Okay, David, I have some good things to say. <laughs> First of all, you're holding the tiller exactly right and not everybody does that. You're putting it on your knee, which is nice because that helps you not steer when you don't want to. Um, I don't know if that was conscious or not, but that's a good thing. You're holding the main sheet correctly. Um, I don't, you, if you remember, he holds it with a thumbs up grip, and that's the only way in my mind to hold it. Um, he does hike at times, and that's good. He's looking out of the boat quite a bit, and that's good. So, this guy's only been sailing these small boats for what, three years now, David? Right, three years. And actually, you had a couple of races where you put yourself on the right spot and did really well yesterday. 
Yeah, yeah Steve okay. beat me by a half a boat length. That would have been my first win ever. <laughs> awesome. Sorry about that. <laughs> His tacks were pretty clean. I, I watched his handoff of the tiller, and it looked like he did a pretty good job passing it behind his back. I didn't look at it in enough detail to see if he missed anything else, but uh, it looked good in terms of the dynamics. The only thing I would say, yes, I thought you're right. I mean, a lot of guys will totally let go of the tiller during the tack, and he didn't do that. Maybe he did at sort of the end of the tack for a little bit, but nothing major. But he has to get across the boat faster. Mm -hmm. He's kind of ambling across the boat and he needs to get over there and seated as soon as possible on the other side and they know it's he's a big guy but there's a lot of big guys that can do that but in light air who was the guy that told us to stay on the um the new lured side until the boat starts to heal before you cross over oh yes yes you you know it, 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 the next level up is to roll the boat so what Dennis is saying is, you know, the boat's healed up on, on the tack he's on, on, on port right now. He should let the boat roll over to the right angle of heel on starboard as it turns through the wind, after it turns through the wind. And, and do that roll fast and then cross under. But still, when you cross, Whenever you cross, either early or late, depending on whether it's heavy wind or, or light, you need to cross quickly and get into the new position. Okay, well, let's let's take a look at some of these. I'm going to go back to um, the uh, the slides for a minute, and we'll we'll just brow, uh, browse through some of these points in more detail. So, put pressure on the boat. Uh, a lot of this is mental imaging in my mind. If you remember why or how these things are important or, or what they look like, it'll help. And I put this picture up there for a reason. Look at all the guys on the rail there. I mean, that's what you really want. You want as much weight on the rail as you can because your forward force you know, how much the sail is pushing you forward is limited by how much healing force you can balance. Does that image make sense to you? The sail's pushing to the side and a little bit forward. So in order to get, in order to get the most forward out of it, you have to counterbalance the side force. And the more pressure you can put on that boat, healing, balance, and hiking, you know, to balance the healing force, the faster you're going to go. You're always looking to put as much pressure on the boat as the wind will allow. So when you see somebody hiking and you're not, you should be thinking, uh oh, what's wrong? What, did I, what am I doing? Why am I not getting the force in the sail? Maybe you're just in less wind. But if you're near them and, and you're hiking and they're hiking and you're not, that's a problem. So a, a couple of things we saw in the video was uh, trim hard and bear off. Dave, Dave was luffing to depower, but he shouldn't have been. He should have had his controls on, not let the sail luff, because luffing the sails is, is like creates a lot of drag and it's, it's not putting force on the boat. And of course, hiking, we can talk more about that. And all you guys need to learn how to get your butt outside the rail and your shoulders outside the butt and your legs extended. And Dave, when he hiked, had pretty good technique. He had straight legs. He was, you know, extended out. Um, so you just got to be wanting to hike more. Let's talk about this trim to the leech and steer hey. to the love. Hey, Al. Yeah. Let's Real quick. What do you mean by luffing the sail? Is, is, is letting off on the main sheet or? Let's go it? look at, uh, let's go back to one of those, um, hold on, we'll go back to one of those video snaps. So let's pull back here. See those bubbles? 
Yeah. That's what you don't want. You want the front of the sail to be firm. Okay. Okay. That's where all the power, you know, I mean, that's, he's lost here. He's lost what a, a fifth of his power in his sail. If that's a fifth of the sail area. Wow. Okay. And you, and how do you, and, and that is just not setting the sail angle to the wind properly. Well, it's right. both. Yes, you're, you're right. It's, it's sheeting the sail in so that it, it, the angle of attack is a little bit bigger, if you will, to the wind. And also turning the boat, he, you know, heading the boat down in this case mm. to, uh, to get that. So yeah. just at a basic level, right, you really sail, when you're sailing upwind, you sail as close to the wind as it will allow you. And you do that by bringing the sail in as far as the leech will let you. And then you head up until the sail starts luffing and then you starts bubbling, in other words, and then you head off just a little bit below that. And you yeah. said luffing. Go, Go ahead, Vicki. This is Lucy. You said luffing is the last resort. In what re Under what situation would you luff? Well, so... This boat is very overpowered. So that's why most people are afraid to put power in the sail because they think they can't handle it and they're going to tip over. And so they, they shy away from it and they sail what we, I call the sailing soft, right? You're not putting the force in the boat. You're comfortable and all that, but an angle of heel may be good, but you're sailing soft. So, as the wind comes up, however, you may have to luff the sail a little bit to keep it upright. But that's only after using your your other controls, your bang, your traveler, primarily. Your yeah, other. if you if you see me out there luffing on a windy day, that means I have everything, all my controls on, my sail pulled in and as much as I can handle. Um, but you know, I'm not six feet tall. Uh, so I can't muscle the boat around quite as much as, as some of the guys who are taller. So my, it becomes a, essentially a, yeah, a last resort to keep my boat still moving through the water, um, and going fast, but it's not so much that it's, uh, you know, ultimately detrimental. Um, so it's still controlled. Yeah. So Robert, keep in mind, I think there's something, uh, fundamental to think about. There's a, there's sail angle to boat, sail angle to hull, and then there's um, sail and hull to wind. And so if your sail is all the way in, let's say, it's in tight, and you point your hull up tighter into the wind, more directly into the wind, you're gonna luff. If you keep your hull still and you ease your sail so that it points out more, so that it's out more, it's going to luff. So you don't want to have your sheet really eased and then point down to stop the luff if you're trying to go straight upwind, you know, upwind. Right. So, you want it farther. So, yeah. so well, when Al talks about um, sheeting to your leech, that's what's going to be talking about how do you set your angle of sail to, to hull. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Chris at one time had uh, pointed out a benchmark for beginner sailors, which I was uh, on this kind of a boat, um, that the boom should be at the corner of the, you know, of the um, transom. Uh, and light air only. Let's, well, yeah, but that's why well, we're going to go to this next subject, guys. I would not go by where your boom is. I would go by where your leech is. So let's talk about that. It's a good segue. Trim to the leech and steer to the luff. So the leech again is the aft uh, edge of the sail, right down here. There it is. And you have these nice telltales on at least the top batten of your leech. And those are very helpful. I put them on all of my battens because they indicate whether the air is flowing off of that leech. And what you want is in here. Okay, so let's just let's start this whole slide. Really, you're powering up or depowering the sail with the leech. 
If, this, if you let the sail out, the leech is loose and it's flapping all over. If you pull it in, it starts to power up and the more you pull it in, the more it powers up and then pretty soon it gets too far in and then it like closes off the sail and this air can't flow over it. So then it depowers again. So you're looking for that spot where the leech is just right, not hooked in and not splayed out, not you know flapping in the breeze. So you power up with the leech and then you find your groove upwind that Rob was just talking about by sailing to the luff, by trimming to what the luff, by heading to, to, to what the luff is doing. So yeah, sailing upwind is a combination of your heading and your boom angle, but I think of them in two stages. I think of setting my boom angle with the leech and then my heading by looking at the luff. Does that make sense? Trim to the leech, steer to the luff. Now let's talk about what that leech should look like. So what I do is I trim my main sail in until that top batten right here is rough upwind in, in a normal breeze where I'm not overpowered. And that's roughly parallel to the boom. If you're sitting down in the cockpit here and you're looking up, you can see the boom angle and you can see the leech angle or the batten angle and they should be roughly parallel. That means the sail is powered up and David actually does this most of the time. Let's take a look at his, let's take a look at one of his uh, shots here. That's not bad right there. So look, there's the angle of, you can't really see it very well, but if you looked at that top batten, it'd be about like this, right? And here's the boom, about the same angle. And you don't see a big sag up here where the sail is out, you know, out the leech is back out here somewhere. There's a nice tight line there. If you were looking, let's see if I can, yeah, I can't get a different, uh, there's some other shots in here where you could see that, but you want that sail not twisted at the top. You want it nice and straight uh, as it goes up, not twisted off. So that's one clue. Oh. The next clue is that the leech telltales are active. So in heavy air, they're gonna be streaming behind. You're not much you can do about it. But in medium air like this, you want those things to be dancing behind and straight back and then behind the sail a little bit. If they're just streaming straight back, then you're not trimmed in hard enough. So you want them to be dancing and it's amazing if you just take another click or two on the main sheet and watch what happens to those. I mean, that'll help you find the sweet spot. Just take another click in or two on the main sheet and see what happens, you know, in, in, eight, in seven or eight miles an hour of wind. And you'll find out, wow, I can point another two or three degrees higher because I got more power in my sail. And you may feel the boat jump a little bit like, oh, I better start hiking. Al, I don't, I don't get that. I mean, why wouldn't them being uh, streaming straight back be the perfect way to go? You, you said you want them to curl around the other side of the sail? Yeah, what's happening is, this is aerodynamics now, and I had to really look into this to figure it out, but the, the, the pressure of the, the air on both sides of the sail is different. In other words, the pressure on the windward side is more than the pressure on the leeward side. Just like, um, uh, and if you ever heard the, um, you know, wind, wingtip vortexes and wake turbulence uh, in air, you know, in airplanes, what's happening is when this, when the air exits the back of the sail, it's got this differential between the windward and leeward side of the sail, so it has to curl around to uh, to equalize. So you're gonna ha you're gonna have uh, that telltale swirling to the back of the sail because of that vortexing that's taking place there. 
So that's not bad. That's not a bad thing. Well, you're saying it's preferable. Yeah. It's to having a streaming straight path, it's right? Highly preferable, right? Okay. And it's preferable because you have maximum differential pressure between the windward and leeward side of the sail. Well, not exactly, because right. you 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 have you have some you have more pressure than you would if it was just streaming. You don't want to necessarily maximize it where it's always stalled behind there. You just want it. You want it to be because that what happens if you watch this. Uh, you'll see that there's vortexing and then it goes away. It's kind of an intermittent thing when you watch a sail uh, in a wind tunnel. So, there, you know, it's kind of streaming for a little bit and then vortexing. There's some really weird terms like the cutta condition and all kinds of crazy stuff that's going on there that the aer aerodynamics professors talk about all the time. So basically, you want it dancing to the back. You don't want it fixed back because you could be right you know, way uh, pointing way low to get that. Right. You want act. I call it active. Right. And and you don't want that leech. Another way to look at it is if you watch the leech, it might wave around the upper leech. It might wave around a little bit. Maybe wave back. You know. Um, when I say wave, move back and forth to windward and leeward. You don't want it so hard that it's frozen where it can't do that. Um, because then when a puff hits, it's not going to release a little bit and, and depower you. So trim to the leech. And in, Hardy says in light air, that might mean your, your boom is all the way out to the corner of the boat, but I wouldn't Again, I wouldn't look at that. I'd look to see if my leech telltales are active and my leech isn't too closed or open. Okay? So once you've got that trim, now you have to get your boat pointed in the right direction. And that means you, you steer, you head down until your luff of your sail right along here is firm, no bubbles like we saw. And no backwind, backwinding is another term for bubbles. You know, the, the, if it's bubbling, the wind is hitting it from the leeward side and bubbling it. You'd like to see these guys streaming, these luff telltale streaming. Well, uh, yeah, well, it's, there's two. There's, I mean, there's two sets. There's one on the windward side, and there's another set on the leeward side. You always want the leeward side luff telltale streaming because you want smooth flow over the back of the sail. And you want your windward left tail tails either streaming or just periodically lifting up a little bit. And we don't have to talk about why. It's, it's really the best uh, efficiency of the sail if they're periodically lifting a little bit. But don't worry too much about that. Make sure your left tail tails on the, on the leeward side of the sail are streaming and your windward are not. So your first thing is don't be luffing this, don't be backwinding or luffing your sail. Make sure your leeward luff telltales are streaming, your windward luff telltales are, are mostly streaming. And what you'll do is you're on your side stage, you'll get used to what angle they look like they're pointing at. And if you, I don't have them shown here, but you should have telltales on your side stage and they're pointing sort of back towards this part of the sail. And all of that was all, those are all nice visual cues for getting the heading correct. And then like Vicky said, every change, every, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. Every time the wind changes, you got to change. You may have to change both your heading and your, and your, uh, but it's, but it's always the leech and, and the luff that you're worried about. That's my two cents. That's really been a help to me. Questions? Vicki, would, would you agree with this? Do you do something different? Sorry, I'm chewing. Um, no, I would agree with it. I um, trim my sail first. Um, and then, yeah, I'm always, always watching the left of my sail. Uh, check off my battens. Um, 
and now my bands, my telltales. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm constantly, yeah, making adjustments. I, um, I guess the one thing I would say is, it, and this might just be me, but I'm not usually a person who needs to head down. Um, so, um, you want to make sure because it can also feel really fast. So if your sail trim isn't right and, um, you're heading down, you might be heading way off the wind to, um, make sure that you're not luffing. So you got to make the sh sail trim right first and then, you know, key in your point of sail. So, um, so, so she, cause she's, you don't want to be reaching. Yep. This one is number one. Get your main trimmed. Head. Now I said head down because I was thinking of David here. <laughs> David sure. could have headed down. And he does need to head down. Yeah. But, one of the big guards against heading down too far is if you head down too far, then these leeward left tails will no longer stream. Correct. So that's the cure to heading down too far. And salesing just happens to have a great set of visible left tail tails, you know, sail tail tails for your luff and lee and uh, both sides of your your luff to make sure that you're not doing that. All right, let's move on. Feather and ease, hike and trim in a puff. A little drawing over here, a little gif. Do you, do you see what's do you, do you see what's happening here? This is the the boat's moving this way. The wind is coming from here. But since the boat is moving this way, your telltales on your side stays are going to show of wind in between those two, right? We call that the apparent wind. It's the combination of the true wind and the and the moving through the air wind, the head wind that you create. Now, I'm showing a puff here. So this part of the wind equation is getting bigger in a puff, right? And what's it doing to the apparent wind? Somebody answer that. This is a puff. Direction is changing. Yeah, it's it's not only getting bigger, but it's changing in which direction? It's changing away from the boat, sort of, right? Like a lift. We would call that a lift, right? Your telltales would start pointing a little more sideways, right? When you saw that, everybody understand that? Nod your head. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. So what does that mean for sail trim? When this puff hits, even though it's in the same direction as the old, as the wind, what does that mean for what your sail should do if, if when this puff hits? Should it stay in the same place? Wouldn't you have to let it out a little bit? Exactly. Because otherwise it's not trimmed properly anymore. So that's why you have to ease your sail in a puff. Even if you think you can handle it and it's not going to knock you, you know, heal you up, you have to ease because your, your, your sail trims not right anymore. And if you look at your leeward telltales, they'll start uh, dancing. They'll start fluttering away from the sail in this puff. Well, what if you head it up a little bit instead of easy to... No, what's better? What do you think? You could head up, and I said feather and ease, but he, actually easing is more important because you can do it faster and you can do it without moving your rudder and moving your rudder slows you down, right? So if you jam your rudder into the, in, you know, jam your, jam your tiller to leeward, you're gonna slow down because the rudder's breaking, making, making, acting like a brake and slowing you down. So you can only, you should only let your rudder feather up, feather the boat up a few degrees and take most of the force of the puff with the easing of the main. And the reason, another reason is it'll let you 
accelerate, right? You will accelerate by easing the main. So your images here are, you're trying to keep the boat on its lines without healing any more or less and accelerate at the same time by feathering, by heading up slightly, three to five degrees, you're draining ground to windward. And then the key is when that puff goes away, what do you got to do? Trim. What? Trim the main. Trim back in. And look how fast it might go away and how fast you might have to trim in. Right? So the, the way I think of it is you put your controls on before the puff hits because if you don't, you know, if you don't have the bang on, the sail's going to get fuller when you, when you ease the main. So you want your bang on. You ease that main as rapidly as needed to maintain your angle of heel. That might mean, you know, a whole armful of sheet out within a, a second. It might mean letting go of the main, letting it run through your fingers, your grip, but it's got to be as fast as it's needed to, to, to keep the boat on its lines. And then at the same time, you could steer up very slightly, but only a few degrees because steering up is slow. And hike. And you hike. You have to hike. I didn't put that in there. It's in the title, but in. And then you have to be ready to get that main back in as fast as you can once the puff subsides a little bit. But all, all five, all four of those steps, controls on before, easing the main, steering up, trimming back in, you got to put all those together. Because if you don't do any one of those, it's, it's just not going to work out as well. So you're putting the controls on before the puff hits based on what? Anticipation of the puff moving down the lake and, and finding you? Yeah, you're seeing it. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I got to watch the wind. So as you see that puff approaching you, you know it's going to be a puff. You need to pull on your controls, bang mostly, um, and then you can even ease the sail right before that puff hits you. Because the idea, one of the main ideas of easing the sail is to keep your angle of heel, right? So you're going to ease it a little bit and you're going to hike. <clears throat> and if you can do that right before the puff hits, you won't heel up as high, right? Because you know when the puff hits you, your boat heels up real high and then you're letting your sail out. Well, then you've, you've killed all of your speed, right? So you want to have your controls on, you, the, the wind is approaching, you're going to let that sail out right before the puff hits you so that you can hike when you're in the puff. And then as soon as that puff is gone, you can pull the sail back in, right? And that's going to keep your boat from doing, you know, sort of I can't, it's kind of like a teeter-totter, right? Keep it from healing way up and going way down. You want to keep like that angle of heel and that's going to help that by easing right before the puff hits you, hiking when you're right in it and then pulling it back in as soon as the puff is, is leaving. Okay. Are you I, seeing the I really thing? believe that Kent Hager is the master of this because he also adds the idea and Andy says this too is you'll feel a little pressure on your helm. You'll feel the tiller pulling a little bit when this puff hits. And just let that, let your hand follow that pressure to, to lure, you know, to move the tiller to lure just a little bit because at the same time, then you'll be gaining ground to windward. You'll be pointing up a little more. And that really makes a huge difference. So you've got to learn how to, with two hands, one, one hand does something different. The, the tiller hand moves very slowly and slightly a few degrees, and the sheet hand moves as fast as, in the same direction towards the sail, but as fast as it's needed. So you're doing the same, you know, you're doing something slightly different with each hand. And the thing you shouldn't do, but you'll see all the time, is someone will get, uh, someone will get hit with a puff, and they'll crank over like this. They'll be hiking like crazy. And then finally they'll go, oh, I should ease my sheet. And then the boat finally comes down. And, and so they've lost all that time where your blades are cavitating through the water. Exactly. 
you haven't gained acceleration, you're really better off easing, even though you feel like you're letting go of some of the pressure, you can't use all that pressure anyway. So keep your boat on its lines. The other thing I found when I started to get really maniacal about doing this is I almost never tip over doing this because if you're in a position where you're so far up that you're gonna lose it in a tip over, then, then probably you're letting your boat rise up too much in the first place. If you keep your boat pretty much on its lines by easing your sail, you're much less likely to tip. Yep. And let's not waste time on this. Uh, it's not wasted, but if you think about a lull, it's the opposite. Instead of easing your main, you could actually trim in a little bit momentarily, momentarily now. And you can feather down, you can head the boat down just a hair. Get your weight in instead of hiking. Now the opposite, you're getting your weight in. And then you will have to ease the sail for the, for the leech to be in the right position. A lot of people just bear off in a lull. They think, oh, I lost all my power. I have to bear off. But we'll work on that later. That's a, that's a tougher skill to learn. All right, let's keep going. Work the controls. So this is John Porter. Look at this picture over here. See how much mass bend they have? They're not getting that from just cheating in the main heart, although that's partly it. They've got a lot of bang on. Now they have two people on board and they can handle all this pressure, but if your sail isn't sometimes, if your mast isn't sometimes bent this far, then you're not working the controls hard enough. I like to think of the sail as one of those continuously variable transmissions. You know, it's got a different gear ratio for every different, uh, you know, wind, wind uh, resistance or uh, hill, you know, that you're climbing. And it makes that smart decision to put that transmission in the right gear ratio for the conditions. And that's really what these controls do. And the other thing, my mental image is that, and John taught me this, you, you pull on some of these things as hard as you can, but you're not gonna break them. Well, you might break them, but it's not usually. You should be pulling on this bang as, and they have, they are pulling as hard as they can on this stuff. So get your gloves, get your grip strength and, and really wail on these things. And we talked about the order, okay. So as the breeze builds, and this Zach, Zach was good at helping me get this. First thing is trim the main harder because What's the leech going to do when the breeze builds? If you picture the wind getting stronger and stronger, what is that upper leech that we were just talking about going to do when the breeze increases? Falls off. Falls off, right? So you want to resist that. So you're really trimming against the pressure that is being created on the leech. And that's why in heavy air, you're approaching block to block. You've got to keep that main in hard to keep that leech behaving. All right, now you can't do that um, without some vang, right? If you try to trim the main in hard without some vang on, you'll be, you'll be over or you'll be tempting to go over. So as you trim your main, you have to tighten your vang. And that vang would be from fully slack in light air to as hard as you can pull in heavy air. Because you're wanting to flatten the sail, right? To depower it. And then you have to ease that bang just as you do ease your main when the wind lightens up. So they kind of go together in my mind. I've actually started, and you watch the sea boat sailors, the crew is trimming the bang at the same time that the skipper is trimming the main. The skipper takes a little bit up on the main and the, and the crew takes up a little bit on the bang. And when the skipper wants to ease, unless, not always, if it's just um, the skipper easing for a puff, he doesn't have to, but if the wind is easing up, then both the skipper and the crew are, 
you know, easing the main and the bang together. So those are the two main first controls. And then your Cunningham, we can talk more about that. Read the sales Zing article or look at the sales Zing article on the Cunningham, but that just keeps the sales draft position where you want it. Uh, it also helps you, uh, helps you depower a little bit too. And then my favorite is dropping the traveler. You, you put on a healthy dose of Cunningham and Vang and your sales flatter, but you're still overpowered, you got to drop the traveler. And when you do, you can trim the main even harder to keep it flat. Yeah, hey, what does drop the traveler mean? Okay, you've got this um, in your boat. I don't have, we'll go back to Dave's picture. See this bar across here, Bob? Robert? Yeah, yeah. That's where your main is sheeted from, right? The block on the right. main is sheeted from this right. little bar on here. If, if the sail is, if this, if this block is under directly vertically below that, then this is pulling hard down on the sail. But if, if the sail is out here farther and this block is over here, then the angle of that it's going to be this way, and it's not going to be pulling down as hard. Mm -hmm. Pulling more side. Any idea how it's so nice. The breeze okay. is very heavy. You want to move this little car down this way. I see. Okay, so you can pull down the sail. Yep. So it's what like it does. It makes the boat so much more forgiving because now the sail isn't angled <laughs> so much uh, toward the center. Mm -hmm. More of its angle, it's angled out more, and so your it, it has more forward force than it. You know, the, the forward force increases and the healing force decreases slightly because mm. the sail is now pushing you, you know, a little more than it is healing you over. Got it. Okay. So you gotta use that traveler, uh, guys, and I know a lot of people don't do it because it's you know another control to manage, but you got to use it. So when you say drop the traveler, you're dro you're moving the traveler underneath the the, the boom. Correct. Got it. Moving, okay. moving it to leeward. Right. Okay. Let's see. Back to. And, and Al, I got a, I got a quick question on that. I've been trying to wrap my head around that for a few days. But but drop of the traveler, in my mind, I guess does two things, right? Where you can keep the sail flatter. As you as you as you pull in, but then also, what what is there a portion of that that gives you more reading power? It 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 helps you right keep the boat upright, right? Because right. if your sails trimmed onto the center line, if your traveler's on the center line, and your sails trimmed in, then that sail is pushing you over more than as if if it's further out, right? Right. And so, yes, definitely. And the boat is so much more forgiving. When a big puff hits and that traveler's down, you're not going to feel the same um, tendency to heal up that you are if the traveler's on the center. Right. Perfect. But when you do that, you're losing some pointing ability, and that's why you have to trim even harder, because that leech, you want to keep that leech in, you know, behaving. Yeah, keep it flat. Yeah. Yep. And then as the breeze goes down, number five there, right here, as the breeze goes down, you, you back these steps up. So you bring the traveler up. You can loosen the Cunningham and loosen some Vang and, and then let the main out, uh, ease the main a little bit. So it's a constant, like Vicky says, it's a constant progression. Where are you on this scale? And you know you're going back and forth, and you just have to learn how to pay attention to this while you're doing everything else. And that means you know using one hand for both the main and the main sheet and the pillar, while you use your other hand to move these guys around. You just have to get comfortable with that. And on Beulah. Or lakes like Beulah. I mean, it's constant. 
Yeah, when you have a very up uh, up and down kind of day, I'm like you, uh, um, this is this is continuous. You're gonna be going through this all the time. You may never, you know, if it's not a super windy day, you may never get to drop the traveler. Um, but if the wind lightens up significantly, not making these adjustments back to where they were before can be um, very, can have a very um, bad impact on you. So you've got yeah, to we'll, keep going with them. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, and we'll talk about that. Oops. Um, we'll talk about that in one of the upcoming slides. Maybe it's the next one. Maybe I'm lucky. Well, here's angle of heat. Let's let's get rid of this. Uh, let's take care of this real quick. There's lots of reasons for angle of heel. In one book, I says be like Goldilocks, not too cold, not too hot, just right. And what's the difference? Why is just right? Uh, just right. What's the distinguishing factor there? You want your board perpendicular. Board is vertical, right? That makes it the most effective. And you have, this drawing isn't great because you're, I don't think your bow, your bow will be in the water that much, but it reduces your wet. So, so really your images are, your boards are effective with the right angle of heel. You have less surface of the boat in the water. Uh, you have less helm pressure, that is to say, have you ever tried to steer a boat by just tipping it one way or, you know, leaning it one way or the other? Even in a motorboat, if you just lean to one side or the other, it steers, right? Well, the same thing is true here. If you're too hot, this boat is trying to steer up, steer to the left. If it's headed away from me, I guess it's, I guess this is headed away from me. It's trying to steer up to the right. You're going to feel that helm tugging, and you don't want that. So you want to be here. And then the other, this is really sophisticated, but the scows are designed so that when your heel is just right, the, the boat, the water line is actually longer. Just look at, look at the shape of the hull, and you can sort of imagine that. And so if the boat's longer, it's a faster boat. Fast, longer boats are faster boats. We could talk about why, but you know, we don't want to take the time to do that now. Okay, so work on keeping the water right below the rail at the chain plate. Learn how to, Dave, Dave, you can work really hard on this. Moving your weight in and out, and there's like five positions, you know, full hike, sitting in the center of the boat, sitting to leeward on the leeward side, sitting way under the boom, and even sometimes hiking to leeward to keep the boat just right. All right, let's keep going because we're running out of time. Uh, next slide. Hey, let's talk about this. This is really important, I think. You all know about airline airplane wings and flaps, right? And what what does the what does the pilot do once he's up to up to cruising altitude, and he's got the, the plane moving. Which one of these images is, is consistent? Well, you lower the flaps to get more lift, at, at, uh, especially at, at, as you go slower. Right. And, but it, you get more lift, but you get more drag also. Exactly. And so as you go faster, you get drag. Which of these is a low, the lowest drag situation? Middle one. Because he's got his, he's got his, uh, his other oh, oh, well, that was trick. Anyway, this is fuel efficiency, right? I mean, if they didn't have flaps, we'd have terrible fuel efficiency. So the way you think about this is you get your you accelerate the boat with a full sail like this, like this one, or even like this one. And then when you get there, then you flatten the sail and you'll have less drag and you can go fast. So you work on shifting gears. Once you get up to speed, you tighten your main sheet to bend the mast and flatten the sail. And then once you slow down, if you feel yourself slowing down, you ease the main to get back to a fuller shape 
and accelerant. That's really important. And if you can do that, Vicki does that very well. I mean, I need to, I need to take lessons from her because she just does it instinctively. And the other thing that you need now, to Now, it took a long time to learn. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing you need to realize is that when you're overpowered, letting your sail out or luffing is not going to make you go faster. You're going to have a fuller sail that's luffing and it's a very high drag situation. So that's why we say you have to sheet in harder. You can drop your traveler and you can sheet in harder to keep that sail flat. And then in very light air, you may want a flatter sail also, but we, we won't talk a lot about that. Now. Dirty air drives you crazy. There's two great pictures here. Will, my friend Will sent me this. These, these are sailboats sailing in fog. Look at the trails they're leaving. And if you look at this boat, there's really two zones of dirty air behind a boat. One is right here where you're blanketed. The wind's coming from the top of the picture. So you don't wanna be in that zone for sure. And even if you think you're out here behind this boat, that boat is, this boat is hurting you if you're right here. You can't keep up. So the images you should have is, first of all, dirty air is everywhere, but you can't see it. Second, if you're in dirty air, you're not going to be fast, even if you're a good sailor. And the problem with that is it makes you second guess yourself. You think, well, what's wrong with me? I thought I was fast. Why am I not doing well? So this is why starting is so important. If you don't get a good start, you've got all of these boats in front of you messing up your wind. You have to find a lane, a, we call it finding a lane. Find a clear lane of air somewhere up here. If, you know, if, you're, if this boat were in your way, get out over here or get out over here. Don't tack into a bad lane where there's somebody in front of you and downwind you know, you have to defend your air. You have to defend against people coming up behind you and defending your air. So I like that the, Stephanie didn't say this uh, exactly, but it makes you crazy because you're not doing well and you don't know why. And you think, well, I'm just dumb or I took the wrong tack or, you know, whatever. But it's really that you weren't sailing fast because you were in dirty air. It may be. Get comfortable in boat. Uh, my uncle built one of the first things he told me make things easier for yourself minimize distractions and there's a whole bunch of stuff here you know how do you grip the main sheet do, can you grip it hard enough do you have enough strength does your main sheet run freely do you have enough purchase on your main sheet by by that i mean you know i i went to a five to one main sheet I add an extra block and I'm really liking it because it makes it a little easier to sheet as hard as I need to keep it untangled. All these little problems, your grip on your tiller, get comfortable with that microphone grip that you saw Dave using. Uh, tacking when you cross tack, you know, pass the thing behind your back, sitting on the low side. Locking it in like Dave was doing by putting his knee, putting it on his knee. Make sure your controls work, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these things. Just got to find ways to make all this stuff easier and less overwhelming. Let's do last slide was Brian's questions. Brian, what I think I'm going to do rather than we said an hour and a half and then we're there, I'm going to refer you to this Steph and Maggie's uh, webinar they did on starting sure. this answers this answers all of almost all of those probably not the last one but anything else uh anybody wants to discuss um defending your position on downwind that was on a slide how do you do that oh. well i would look at um they always say look at that other boat's telltales if you can see the side state telltales if they're pointing at you then then you're in a bad spot, right? If their wind indicators are pointing at you, then you're in a bad spot. So move from move one way or the other, you know, head up, head down, 
get out of their wind shadow. That's all. That's really the, I mean, it's, it's almost that simple. Vicki, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, downwind, that everyone behind you is a giant blanket, right? So you have to find the clear lane. And that's what, that's what Al's talking about. If their wind, if the wind coming down the lake is coming straight over, the, uh, over the, them at you, you're not getting the clear air. So you need to shift, you need to steer one way or the other. So you get your clear lane of air. Does everybody know the difference between strategy and tactics? So the, the rule that we were told by Dave Dellenbaugh and, and uh, Stephanie Robel repeated that in this webinar is strategy is how you would sail if you were the only boat out on the water. You know, what would you do? And what decisions would you make? Tactics are what you do when some other boat gets in the way of that strategy. So when you think about downwind, something that's important to know is don't let your, your mentality, don't lose sight of your strategy because you're trying to deal with some other downwind boat. Deal with the downwind boat in a way, the other downwind boat in a way that maximizes your ability to get back onto your strategy. Don't, because what will happen is you'll see people all heading off to the corner of the race course because they're trying to get clear air. So in your own head, always try to think, okay, given my strategy, how can I get into clear air in a way that gets me back on my strategy that doesn't allow me to get taken off the race course? Dave Ward's holding up a issue of Feed and Smarts is a very good newsletter to subscribe to. This guy, Dave Dellenbaugh, is a very good explainer. And was that the article on clear air, Dave? Strategy yeah. and tactics, yeah. We'll yeah. see you on the